Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. Well, I trust that you have been enjoying our walk that Pastor Coggin has been taking us through, through the study of the book of Acts. And I, I really have enjoyed, and I hope you have too, the way he has been walking us through it chronologically. And he's been doing it by major sermon uh, that exists in that book. And there are many of them, and it's very fun to, to walk that through within its historical context. I appreciate as well just how practical he has made that study for us. And Practical in the sense of being encouraging and challenging at the same time, right? Uh, to see how God has used these men and not only used them, but how they prepared for ministry to capitalize on opportunities that God gave them and the encouragement and the challenge for us to prepare ourselves well to be active ministers and testimonies, ambassadors for Jesus Christ, to create those opportunities and to capitalize on those opportunities. Well, I think if I were to probably take a poll amongst us here, I would probably find that the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, probably is not a high traffic book for us. Uh, you know, when you finish one book or, or, a, or a book in the Bible and you get ready to start another and you're getting and you're thinking about which one am I going to start now, probably not many are going to get excited and say, oh boy, I get to read Galatians again. And I think if we were to take that, that poll in, uh, in a wider survey, we would probably find that same thing is true. You know, I think the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia, gets ignored because I think many modern-day evangelicals think that Galatians is not relevant for them. They kind of see it as a fixed window for a fixed window period of time and for a very narrow target audience. In today's world, maybe we think that it's, it's more for Jews who become Christians or those we think that are struggling with legalism, we kind of write Galatians as a prescriptive reading for them. We, we see it more of a situational book. Well, I'd like to tickle your thoughts this morning with the idea that the letter that Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia is absolutely relevant for us today. Here's why. Here's a few reasons. One reason is that if you take Galatians and put it side by side or even overlay it over the book of Romans, it's like an executive summary of the book of Romans. And so if, if you're kind of the Cliff Notes kind of a person, well, you, you're going to like Galatians because it's six chapters compared to 16, right? The second reason that's kind of a very fun reason to read and study the book of Galatians, is in the book of Galatians, we get historical insight into the Apostle Paul's early life that we don't get anywhere else in the Bible. And that's not only interesting, but that's actually, as we're going to study, highly important. But digging a little deeper, apart from Romans, without the book of Galatians, we could not clearly understand the effective gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that important of a book. Without Romans, if we didn't have Romans, and without Galatians as well, we could not understand righteousness within the New Covenant context. It's that important of a book. Moreover, without Galatians and apart from Romans, none of us would have the theological truth necessary to justify our claims to Christ based on how we live today. And that goes well beyond whether we can justify eating bacon or not. All this because the letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia gives us the foundational understanding of the new covenant. And it, he gives it to us, to that church and to us, both logically and theologically for practical living. And its outcome, our eternal reward. But interestingly, perhaps, and, and we'll make this point as we go through it, I find the book of Galatians an excellent primer on evangelism. If you can wrap your head around Galatians and the core message that Paul prevents here in Galatians, you're going to be able to very easily explain the Christian faith as well as know how to open a conversation about it. 
It's that practical. So for our study of the book of Galatians, I have four study goals for us. Number one, my, my first study goal for us is I want to burn the thematic context of the book of Galatians into your mind. I just want to burn it there. We're going to do a, a thematic overview of this book, and I want that thematic context to just be burned, seared into your mind. Second of all, I want you to grasp the Apostle Paul's argument for the sufficiency of the new covenant within itself. I want you to grasp Paul's argument for the sufficiency of the new covenant within itself. Third, I want you to wrap your head around the present and practical reality of what life in Christ ought to look like from the inside out. I'll say that again. I want you to wrap your heads around the present practical reality of what life in Christ ought to look like from the inside out. My fourth study goal for us is so that you will clearly understand the transforming reality of the effective gospel of Jesus Christ. Big goals, but attainable goals for our study. Well, hopefully you grabbed on the way in a bookmark for the book of Galatians, the letter Paul wrote to the Galatian church. If you didn't, feel free to sprint and hurdle your way back to grab some and come back so that you can re-engage quickly. Uh, we have, for several of our books that we've studied, we've given you bookmarks so that you have, as a reference, a quick reference guide to the book. So that at a quick glance, you can remind yourself the key details about it as you not only study the book or letter again, but as you disciple others, you still have that big picture as well. So these are your notes for today, and for the most part, we will fill them in and review them. And we'll start with the writer of the letter to the book of, or the letter to the churches of Galatia, and that was Paul. Pretty simple. Paul. The book, or this letter, was written in late AD 49. Late AD 49. It was written during the book of Acts, as you've been prepped well for it. And in our, stu our chronological study of Acts, we are almost, we have just passed the halfway point in the book of Acts. And Pastor Coggan has aptly taught us over and over a title that I have given the book itself of Acts. I call it the Church in Transition. And, and we see that church in tr transition from its inception and as it progresses, it grows in numbers and it expands ge geographically. It's the church in transition. And so the book of Galatians is written during the time where the church was in transition. In fact, by the time we get historically in the book of Acts to when this letter was written, Though we've only studied the book of Acts for, what, seven weeks now, we had an introduction, then we studied six sermons so far, and it only took us that long. From a time perspective, by the time we walk into chapter 15, understand that about 19 years has transpired from Jesus' ascension back into heaven until Acts chapter 15, about 19 years, almost two decades has passed. And that's important because when it comes to this letter to the churches of Galatia, let me ask you this first. What was the first? Chronologically, what was the first book of the New Testament written? Do you remember? Probably. James. Probably James. The second New Testament book or letter written was Galatians, written about four to five years after James. Significant in the sense that the book of James really wasn't a book on hardcore theology. It had to do more with what Christian behavior looks like. Practical theology, if you would. The book of Galatians is really, after 19 years of the early church, is our first book on New Covenant theology. That's significant. 19 years, and now we finally have our first book on formal theology. Practical, but formal theology. Your Bibles probably have in the back of them a section for maps. If you would, go ahead and turn to that map section, and you probably have one that's labeled Paul's Missionary Journeys. So find that map section, Paul's Missionary Journeys. And once you do, see if you can find, and it's probably labeled, uh, if, you're, if your map section is like mine, highlighting the different Roman provinces. Roman provinces. 
Find Judea, and within Judea, find Jerusalem. Did you find that? Now, if you would, travel north up from Judea along the Mediterranean coast, and you will pass through a region called Phoenicia. You find that? Then keep going north, and you will find a region labeled Syria. And within Syria, if you go up right before you have to hang a left on the Mediterranean, you will see in Syria a city labeled Antioch. Did you find that? That's the city that Paul was in when he wrote this letter. He was in the Syrian province of Antioch. The story behind Antioch is fantastic. In fact, it's a great study for us in understanding what healthy marks of church growth really are. This church started pretty much right after the persecution of Stephen. After the persecution of, St of Stephen, uh, persecution of Christians really ramped up tremendously to the point that Herod joined in to try to gain favor with the Jews. So much so that many of the Christians left the Jerusalem Judea area and as we read in Acts, from Acts, starting in Acts chapter 11, we find that they started three churches in three different areas. One church was started, that territory, that region just north of Judea, in Phoenicia. Another church was started on the island of Cyprus. And the third church that Luke mentions in the, uh, our historical narrative of Acts is this church in Antioch, in Syria. Well, evidently, the church in Cyprus matured rather quickly to the point that they actually sent a ministry team from Cyprus to this church in Syrian Antioch to help them grow, help establish their church. And what we see in Acts is it seems that this ministry team really focused on evangelism and evangelism in a, to a particular group of people, Jewish Hellenists. If you remember from our big picture Bible class, we studied Hellenism and what it was, and it was took place, it really gained traction during the time between the Testaments. Hellenism was a package of Greek philosophy, Greek culture, Greek language, Greek religion that Alexander the Great imposed on those nations that he took over. And many of the Jews, and as we walk through the New Testament, we'll see that many of the Jews embraced this Hellenism to save their own skin, really, and to feed their own flesh. So in this area of Antioch, city of Antioch in the region of Syria, evidently there was a pretty good group of Jewish Hellenists. And this ministry train from Cyprus really seemed to concentrate on this group, and God blessed it. God blessed their efforts, and the church in Antioch grew exponentially. So much so that it caught the attention of the church leaders in Jerusalem, and they sent somebody we're very familiar with up to help to encourage and to teach and formalize that church, a guy named Barnabas, who interestingly was from the same area that this ministry team was. He was from Cyprus as well. Well, under his tutelage, that church in Antioch continued to grow. So much so that Barnabas realized that he needed some additional help. So if you look at your maps, just north of Syria is another region called Cilicia. And you see a city there labeled Tarshish? Who do we know that was from Tarshish? Saul. Saul. Paul. And so Barnabas brought... Saul, or Paul, down to Antioch to partner with him in this burgeoning work in Antioch, Syria. And God continued to bless that work as those two discipled that church. So much so that that church became so healthy, and this is one of the final marks of a healthy church, that church was able to commission their own missionaries. And they commissioned both Paul and Barnabas to be their missionaries. It was there then that the Apostle Paul began his first, with Barnabas, his first missionary venture. And so they started, and if you are still with your maps here with Paul's missionary journeys, it's probably labeled his first, second, and third missionary journey. Look at the path for his first missionary journey. It started from Antioch in Syria, and the first place they went was Cyprus. 
And what we learn from Acts is they spent time in the Jewish synagogues there teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, this is Barnabas' backyard. This is where he's from. Well, after they started in Cyprus, they went up then, if you follow the travel route, up to this area we know as Galatia. And there was a northern area of Galatia and a southern area of Galatia. But if you find where he landed and go north through Pamphylia, you will see another region, a very small region, labeled, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Poseidon. And there in Poseida is another city with the name Antioch. It can be very confusing if you're not paying attention. Poseidon, Antioch. And that's where Paul and Barnabas started their first missionary effort. And God blessed it. In fact, this is a missionary's dream. They started, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and they... Paul preached the message of Jesus Christ to the Jews there, and somehow the Gentiles, it was enough attraction, the Gentiles heard pieces and parts or heard about his sermon, and after Paul finished his teaching to the Jews, they caught Paul and said, hey, can you preach that same message to us next week? And he did. And he and Barnabas stayed there, and God blessed that ministry tremendously. So much so that the Jews became very jealous of Paul and Barnabas. And they stirred up the people and got a legal decree to kick Paul and Barnabas out of the city. And so Paul and Barnabas left and they went to their next location, started another church in Iconium. God blessed that work as well. But then the Jews that kicked him out of Sidon Antioch came down to Iconium and worked to create a murder plot for the Apostle Paul to the point that Paul and Barnabas had to leave there. And so they went down to Lystra. Again, great ministry, but they ran into a problem. Paul healed a crippled man. They were so impressed by this that the people of Lystra thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And they were going to try to sacrifice to them. And Paul and Barnabas did everything they could to get them to focus on God, who did the miracle and not them. And so these same people that suddenly were wanting to sacrifice to them and were all excited... The Jews from Sidon, Antioch, and Iconium came down and stirred up trouble for Paul there. Paul being the main speaker, they went after him and stoned him. In fact, they stoned him, and we're talking rocks here, stoned him to the point where they thought he was dead. They thought he was dead, so they dragged his carcass outside the city and dropped it. And when we read in Acts, the disciples, the new church converts that stood around him, suddenly either Paul gained, regained his consciousness or came back to life went back in the city, encouraged the believers for a day, and then left for another city of Derby. Now, after visiting these four cities and going through all they did, because of how God had blessed the gospel and brought people to him, they saw this missionary adventure as a great success. And they had the guts, actually, then, as we read in Acts, to go back and visit each one of those cities after being kicked out after being a murder plot against you, after being stoned to death, they went back and encouraged those individual churches and established a plurality of elders in each one of those churches. And then on their way back, they stopped at two other places, Perga and Atelia, before they headed back to, then to their sending church in Syria and Antioch. All that Paul and Barnabas accomplished in about 12 to 18 months. Talk about an intense time of ministry. Well, turn in the Bibles, if you would. Let's catch up with Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14 of Acts. Chapter 14 of Acts, verse 27. Acts chapter 14. Let's start in verse 27. Now when they, Paul and Barnabas, had come and gathered the church there in Antioch of Syria together, they reported all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. With God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, intentionally shared with the Gentiles, and having the evidence that the Holy Spirit indwelt them as a legitimacy of their conversion to Jesus Christ, as fellow heirs of, then of God's covenantal promises, suddenly there was a theological problem 
that needed a practical solution. If the covenantal promises were made to the Jews and brought to life by the Jews, then for the Gentiles to be part of these covenantal blessings and retain them, the question at hand was, what should that look like both positionally and practically? Let's continue reading in Acts chapter 15 now, verses 1 through 2, as we see this problem come to life. And certain men came down from Judea, that's coming down geographically, to Antioch, and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Bar Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And so now, chronologically, as we walk into chapter 15, chapter 15 is a pivot, a pivot point in the book of Acts with what we call the Jerusalem Council. And we're actually going to go over and read here in just a minute two more sermons. One that Peter will give and one that James will give, more of a statement about this issue at hand. Let's continue reading in verse 3 of chapter 15. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused a great joy to all the brethren. And when we, they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, Christian Pharisees, rose up saying, it is necessary to, and if you're writing in your Bible, it's a good place to write, number one, put a number one, it's necessary to circumcise them. And number two, to command them to keep the law of Moses. Two things that these Christian Pharisees brought up. Continuing in verse 6. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. When did that happen? Do you remember? To who? I can't hear you. Cornelius. Thank you, Cornelius. Very good. So God, verse 8, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us and made no distinction between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Paul, Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they became silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God, James continues, from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should know not trouble those who among the Gentiles are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men above the brethren. This is important, so that when Paul and Barnabas got back, it wasn't their sanitized version of the conclusion of this meeting. <laughs> All right? They sent back members of their own to support Paul and Barnabas. Verse 23, and they wrote this letter, 
the apostles, the elders, and brethren, to the church brethren who who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, Syria, Syria, in Syria. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good for Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, preaching, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Thinking and introducing this letter that Paul will then write to the churches of Galatia, go back to verse 23 in chapter 15, and I want you to see who specifically this Jerusalem council wrote the letter that we just read, who they wrote it to. Do you see who they wrote to in verse 23? To the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Did they write it to the churches that Paul and Barnabas had just gotten back from? No. It was just to that church and the church up in Cilicia. And so this helps us as well with the date that Paul wrote this letter to the churches up in Galatia. It was after this Jerusalem council, but prior to Paul leaving on his second missionary journey. We are able to tell from the time he came back to the time he left, he was back in Antioch and had the Jerusalem council. He was back before his second missionary journey for about 12 months or a year. So more than likely, this letter to the churches of Galatia was written after the Jerusalem council. And because the letter was not written to the churches that Paul and Barnabas had just started, likely then, because those churches were facing the very same issue, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Galatian church that we're about ready to study. This letter was a circular letter. It was written to Galatians. I understand all the cities, especially the first four, that Paul and Barnabas visited were all in this region of Galatia. And so this letter was written, one letter was written, and it was to be read and passed along in different churches. It was a circular letter. And as the majority of the New Testament books are reactive, Galatians certainly was. Back to your bookmark, you will see historical, cultural, contextual drivers. And as the book of Galatians was highly reactionary, I want you to understand that there are two issues, two tensions, if you would, that drive the entire book, the context of the entire book. The first historical, cultural, contextual driver was circumcision. Circumcision. The second, we're going to phrase as practical righteousness. Practical righteousness. Righteousness, and you put in parentheses, the law. Paul, throughout the entire six chapters of this letter, is going to deal with this, these two thematic issues, these two tensions that existed in this church. Circumcision and practical righteousness of the law. Or to put it another way, what was necessary to positionally be a Christian? What was necessary to positionally be a Christian? And number two, how to stay a Christian. In other words, how do you justify or validate oneself as a Christian until Jesus comes back? How do you do that? Or to put it another way, 
These two tensions are all about what is necessary to gain and maintain the covenantal promises of God. What is necessary to gain and maintain the covenantal promises of God. I want to role play with you just a little bit and, and kind of put ourselves back in this day and to wrap our heads around what's going on in the church. Myself, I know myself well enough to know that if I was brought up Jewish, had been educated in the Jewish synagogue, and then converted to Jesus Christ, therefore a good student of Scripture, and the Apostle Paul came in and said that it was not necessary to be circumcised or to keep the law, I know myself well enough that if I didn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Paul, I probably would have at least invited him out to a cup of coffee and a Bible study. And, and I, I think this is how the conversation would go. I'm going to pretend you guys are the Apostle Paul. Okay, you pretend you're Paul, and I'm me, all right? I, I would have invited you out to coffee in a Bible study. And dealing with these two tensions and then Paul's claims, I would have said, Paul, you brought your Bible to a Bible study. That's great. Let's turn in our Bibles then, Paul. That's you. Okay, signal for you. Turn to Genesis chapter 17. Because this is really important, Paul. As we both are Bible students, we're both Christians. But hearing you say what you have, I have some serious issues. Because let's read starting in chapter 17 of Genesis with verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be your, a God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You notice everlasting is kind of a theme here. Verse 9, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendants. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in his flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I would have said to Paul, it's pretty black and white, isn't it, Paul? That if you don't want to be cut off from the covenant of God, God's promises, you get circumcised. And you encourage other people to get circumcised. Because if I employ the grammatical, historical, hermeneutic to this text, I think that's what it means. In fact, it seems rather clear that this is meant to be taken literally and is to be perpetual. I probably would have had that conversation with Paul. And then I would have also chatted with him about the present practical righteousness, the law. I would have said, Paul, just from a pragmatic sense, with the law... Righteousness is clearly defined, isn't it? It's very clear what's right and wrong with the law. Likewise, it's very clear in the Bible when it says that there are blessings for following God's law and there are curses for not following God's law. That's black and white. That's cut and dry. So Paul, if you dispatch the law without the law, how in the world 
can you define righteousness? Paul, if you abandon the law, your gospel will become an excuse to sin. Even if that's not your intent, that's what will happen. People will begin spreading grace GM on everything. Because if you abandon the law, Paul, you abandon all objective right and wrong and all objective good and evil. And there's no way that's going to work out well ultimately or eternally for those you seek to save. Plus, Paul, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And take a look, starting with verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. I, I would have said to Paul, Paul, how can you safely, how can you safely annul, justify annulling the law when Jesus himself said, and this is in red print, Paul. <laughs> verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So in my Bible study with Paul, I probably would have wrapped it up and said, Paul, if you can biblically show me with Scripture that we can ditch circumcision and still retain the promises of God and show me how you can biblically qualify righteousness with the Bible, okay, I'll listen. But I don't think you can. Do you understand the validity of this debate that happened? It was a valid discussion. It was a valid debate. And I don't think the Christian Pharisees that brought this up were trying to be prunes. I think they cared for the soul because they had biblical evidence. Well, the fact is, is that if Paul does not conclusively win this debate, we then would have no justification for Paul's gospel or the new covenant as we know it today, nor our lifestyle. Galatians is that relevant to us today. Nor could any of Paul's letters be considered scripture, nor any other apostolic teaching or writing that's based upon it. It couldn't be considered scripture either if Paul doesn't win this argument. So yes, Galatians is a big deal. It's relevant. And Paul has his work cut out for him to convince not only his original audience of this scriptural detail, but us as well. Whether we are truly free from the need of physical circumcision, and from the law of Moses. Well, the spoiler alert is <laughs> that Paul does solve these two tensions, and he will solve them logically, he will solve them biblically, and he will solve them practically. We'll take a careful look how he does based upon the title I've given the book, The Quote-Unquote Nature of the Gospel. That's how he'll win the argument, with the nature of the gospel. And how he does so is by arguing under inspiration that the nature of the gospel matters. On your bookmark then, I've given you an outline for how Paul lays out his arguments in this book from beginning to end. How Paul will argue this as the foundation, this understanding is the foundation for New Covenant theology. He'll start, and this is where we'll start next week, understanding that source matters, then that means matters, and then he'll give us an illustration that who your mother is matters. He'll teach that understanding liberty matters, the walking in the Spirit matters, that the law of Christ matters, and finally he'll bring it to a conclusion of what matters most. And then he'll close in a very personal way. That's the outline to his letter. Well, your homework for this week then is to read this letter. 
And I would encourage you to read it in one setting and read it at least once, if not twice or more. And to read it, understanding, keeping in mind the title, that the nature of the gospel matters. And as you read through, to keep in mind how, as he moves along, he's handling and presenting his arguments. Do that, and I think this letter will start to pop. Well, on the back of your bookmark, one last thing. If you flip it over, you will see that there are key definitions. As this is the first book, formal book on theology in the New Testament, there's some terms we have to be very familiar with and understand as we progress throughout New Testament literature. Terms that are really going to make not only this book, but others come to life. And the first, I'd like to give you a definition today as you're going to be reading the book this week, and that's a definition of grace. Grace is one of those words that has really suffered from generalization and overuse. Kind of like faith, and we'll deal with faith. Kind of like love, where it's become this broad, general thing. To the point it almost means nothing. So general, so broad, that it's very easy to misunderstand the entire concept. So, let's start with, what have you been taught, probably from the Hydra Grasshopper, in Sunday school, what the definition of grace is. Yes, God's unmerited favor. And you can go ahead and write that down. God's unmerited favor. But in writing it down, I want you to understand that's only half the definition. So write down the first half. God's unmerited favor. And then add the second half. Which affects righteousness. God's unmerited favor, which affects righteousness. I have to understand that God does nothing without a purpose. Everything he does has purpose, and everything points back to his character. And the only thing God can do is to affect righteousness. And so the only reason that God gives us his unmerited favor is to affect righteousness. So as you read this, this letter, and really any other New Testament book or letter, I'd encourage you, when you see the, the word translated into English as grace, that you substitute that word for the full definition. God's unmerited favor, that affects righteousness. And if you do that, not only will New Testament theology pop, but the right theology pop. And it won't lead you astray because of broad generalizations. All right, so that's our first definition, God's unmerited favor, which affects righteousness. So as you read, substitute that definition for the actual word, and you'll get the full picture of the theology. All right, well, that's our introduction to the letter to Galatians. Next week, we'll jump into our, the text itself, right, where Paul starts, and boy, he's going to hit the ground running. And he's going to hit the ground running hard. And his first argument is going to start out that source matters. So get familiar with the, with the letter, and we'll jump into our study next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to have your word and to study it. And not only study it, but to understand it for practice in life and to share it with others. Father, I'm excited to have the opportunity to teach this letter. It's such an important foundational letter for the church, both of the day it was written and for us today. To wrap our heads around the effective gospel of Jesus Christ and the promises, as you are a promise keeper, of your covenants. We thank you for including us in those promises, and may we serve you well as a result to bring honor and glory to your name. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.